you so much for having me here today to talk about how Atara is unleashing the promise of cell therapy for cancer and autoimmune disease. Their typical FLS. So Atara is an allogeneic T cell therapy company. Um, we're a leader in the space, and we say that because, as was just introduced, we um, are actually the only ones to obtain regulatory approval for an allogeneic T cell immunotherapy. Uh, that's with our uh, lead asset, Tabulacle Cell. Uh, that was approved in Europe in late 2022. And this platform is based off of actually a natural immune response that we have towards a virus that uh, it basically infects all of us over 90% by the age of 40, Epstein-Barr virus. And we can actually take these cells from healthy donors, these memory T cells, and create products out of them. So uh, we focus now on CAR-T, allogeneic CAR-T, so off the shelf. And we have two assets in our portfolio, ATA3219 and ATA3431, that are based off of the Sepstein Bar virus T cell platform. And ATA3219 is a CD19 CAR, so chimeric antigen receptor. And we're expecting initial data in non-Hodgkin's lymphoma later this year in Q4. Uh, we also are pursuing uh, autoimmune disease, so B-cell-driven autoimmune disease, and we have a cleared IND, and we are starting this uh, in phase one, and we um, are expecting first data in H1, uh, first half of 2025 in lupus nephritis. And we actually just announced a cohort expansion into SLE without lymphodepletion, which could be highly differentiating, uh, with data expected in the second half of 25. And as I said, this platform is based off of Epstein-Barr virus T cells. We do have an approved product in Europe, and that is actually partnered out with a French-based company called PureFob. Um, and they also have global rights to the U.S. Uh, we also just filed the tab cell BLA um, in uh, Q2, so just last month. And the partnership, uh, along with current cash and the uh, projected commercial and sales milestones and double-digit tiered royalties moving forward, um, enable us to have cash runway into 2027. And that obviously gets us past these expected uh, key milestones coming up for us with 3219 and 3431. Now our platform, our, as I said, it's based off of a healthy uh, donors. So these, again, these patients or these uh, 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 people have immune responses to Epstein-Barr virus. They create, naturally just create a, a memory T cells. So we're able to extract those take those, enrich them, and manufacture them. And that's actually the basis of our uh, Tavalexa cell product. So this can kind of by itself go target Epstein-Barr virus-driven um, diseases. So like an ultra-rare lymphoma is what we have it approved for right now. And what's key about this platform is that every allogeneic company has to solve for one thing, which is how do you get these cells in a patient without them being rejected? It's the same concept as organ transplant biology. And so how we solve for this is actually just leveraging nature's biology, right? So we keep the Epstein-Barr virus T cell. Um, almost every other company will take this out, they'll gene edit it out, they'll gene edit the major histocompatibility complex out, um, which has a lot of problems. You know, gene editing is not efficient, it introduces double-stranded breaks, it's not healthy for the cell. So what we do is we keep the Epstein-Barr virus T cell, so it only recognizes Epstein-Barr virus. And what that does is it kind of put blinders on these T cells so it really can't cause graft first host disease. And we've never seen that across the 600 patients that we've treated uh, with this base platform. So that's kind of one axis. The other axis is how do you get the cells in the body without them actually themselves being rejected? So host versus graft. And so we actually leverage the very uh, same principles as organ transplant biology, um, where you have to have some level of matching for that. So we do the same thing, but we only need two out of 10 matches. And so what that enables us to do is get these T cells in a patient without it causing graft versus host disease, but also that patient then doesn't reject the cells. Um, and so the cells can basically get in and do what they need to do. Uh, we also have a very you know, built out robust manufacturing process with biologic like cost of goods. This is important that we're really the only ones that have had uh, you know, taken from preclinical all the way to the commercial. So you know, the whole scalability aspect is so important to allogeneic. And that's really the main value proposition of allogeneic is when you start thinking about these much larger indications in autoimmune, where you're treating hundreds of thousands, millions of patients, an autogos approach, which already has extreme capacity constraints on the oncology side, is impossible to scale. And certainly with six figure like Pogum for autogos versus like the five to 15,000 for allogeneic, there's just not really a business case for autogos in these much larger indications. And so this base platform, this Epstein Bar Buyer T cell platform is what we use for our CAR T portfolio. Now, to give kind of a little bit of a flavor of currently what's available for autogolous versus allogeneic. So autogolous is what all the current CAR T products are for commercial purposes. 
And so what this does is if you're a patient, you basically get your cells extracted out or taken out, it's called apheresis. They're manufactured to put back in. Now, this is a time-consuming process. It requires patients to stop treatment while they're apheresed. That can be problematic, certainly, if you have cancer and you progress, you need bridging therapy, you might get so advanced you can't do it anymore. It requires lymph depletion. The CAR-T manufacturing process is long. It takes two, three, four, five, six weeks. Again, that can cause issues with that bridging and, and progression aspect. And then the post-infusion monitoring, the CAR process itself has a high propensity of cytokine release syndrome, neurotoxicity like ICANs, graft-versus host disease. So it requires a long inpatient monitoring. Now for ATARA, what we've seen in our program so far, so this is kind of the body of 600 patients that we've treated across tab cell and then one of a, a older asset called ATA188 in, in a progressive multiple sclerosis, is that we had this profile of being off the shelf. So it's readily available. Again, how we manufacture is that it's manufactured all before patients need it, and then it's just stored in liquid nitrogen. Uh, no lymphodepletion, requires a five to 10 minute infusion and only one to two hours of outpatient monitoring. So we're, we should have demonstrated this for our Epstein bar virus T cells themselves. And for the CAR T, this is really what we're aspiring to is kind of our long term vision to get to this profile for patients. Now, our platform itself, I talked a little bit right about the base platform is these Epstein Barr virus T cells. They're T cells that recognize, have a T cell receptor that recognize Epstein Barr virus. It's so critically important to keep this T cell receptor. It's been shown in a variety of data, um, as well as clinical, preclinical, that it, you know, the T cell receptor serves as a key T cell survival signal. There's a reason why T cells have this in the first place. So we strongly believe in keeping it. And again, it's that safety mechanism that helps prevent graft versus host disease. Again, we talked about the partial HLA matching. This helps prevent host versus craft. And there's a few other features that we've actually designed in here that have both been independently validated, both um, in academia as well as, as well as industry. And I'll go into that. But the 1XX co-simulatory domain, if you think about the car, it binds and it provides this activation signal inside the cell. Now, if you have too much of a good thing, that can actually be a problem where you have too much activation to start. And this is what can lead to the safety uh, issues, uh, cytokine release syndrome, the eye cans, the neurological toxicity. So what's been demonstrated is that if you actually kind of soften that activation curve a little bit and have a longer tail, that's actually better for expansion and it helps mitigate that T cell exhaustion as well as increased potency. And then also uh, a little bit different here is the less differentiated phenotype. And so cells, of course, can take on you know different flavors and you have more of the stem cell like, which is a cell that can just create more of itself. And you have these effector cells, which are basically kind of the soldiers that go out and they're able to kill the cells. And so you want something kind of right in the middle, something that can kind of create more of itself, but also can differentiate appropriately into those effector cells and go out and kill. And so what we've done is we basically have put all of this into one asset. This is 3219. And so we've shown through 600 patients of data that Epstein-Barr virus T cell platform is, is, is certainly de-risked. It's, it's, you know, it's regulatory approved uh, for a product. Um, and then also Memorial Sloan Kettering, our partners there have actually also put in an earlier generation EBV T cell. So kind of like tablet cell, but not optimized for a memory phenotype. And it doesn't have that 1XX co-stimulatory domain that they've able, uh, been able to show overall survival up to three years in a post-transplant uh, B cell malignancy setting. Now also Novartis has shown with their YTB323 asset. Um, that, so this is the only difference between this and Kimbria is actually, uh, it's just a memory phenotype. It's the only thing that changed. And they're able to show 73% CR and 62% durable CR at six months. So uh, a really incredible profile there. And I'd like to call out probably the most important thing is that they did this at 12.5 million cells. So this is 20X less than what Kimbria is dosed at. So very significant increase in potency. Now, also for 1XX co-stimulatory domain, Takeda did this with their TAC940 asset, and this is the same 1XX co-stimulatory domain as Atara, that they were able to achieve an 87% ORR and a 75% CR at 25 million or 10X less cells than the corresponding autogamous. So again, strong academic and clinical proof of principle that now we're combining the Epstein-Barr virus T cell platform the memory phenotype and the 1XX similar to remain all into 3219, which is our uh, lead asset for uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And there's actually a lot of room to, to um, compete in this. And so again, we, we know that there's a variety of autogolous CAR-Ts on the market. Now the challenge with this is actually the penetration with these autogolous CAR-Ts right now is very minimal. So only 20 to 40% of eligible patients are actually receiving CAR-T therapy today. 
And this is due to a variety of reasons. There's logistical challenges where, again, for that purpose of having to be inpatient to make sure you're following for cytokine release zone, et cetera, you have to have inpatient monitoring. And you really only do that in academic centers, just tier one centers, just due to infrastructure needed. Uh, there's so a lot of in CAR T is mostly it would be great if you could eventually get into the community setting and that would really open up access. And that's what allogeneic uh, can basically do. And on top of that, for those patients that actually access autologous CAR T, only about 30 to 40 percent of those are actually having durable months, pat, durable responses past six months. So there's a lot of room to come in with an allogeneic approach to not only help from an access perspective, but also uh, to compete on a safety and efficacy perspective. And of course, there's bispecifics that have been coming to the market, but there's still a, a pretty, you know, risk benefit profile is still challenging. And there's been a lot of data that have shown incomplete tissue penetration, B cell depletion, and they just have a shorter immune reset than autologous CAR T. So we believe there's a really strong opportunity here for 3219. Now, for preclinical data, we have presented this in the past that 3219 compared to an autologous benchmark, CD19, um, has a superior longer pers persistence that you can appreciate in the green versus the red in the middle, um, as well on the right that we've shown superior efficacy for percent survival, so overall survival in a very challenging CD19 positive tumor model. So preclinically, again, this looks very robust. Now, as many or some of you might be familiar with, the CAR-T field was really kind of set in a, a slightly different direction mid last year when Dr. Shett, who's a physician out of, of Germany, came across with some academic uh, case studies where he put basically kind of the same idea as, a, uh, as an autologous CAR-T in an oncology, but started using it for autoimmune. And that makes sense. Autoimmune diseases are often driven by uh, malignant B cells or autoreactive B cells. And so if you take those out, theoretically, it should help. And that's exactly what he saw. So in the middle here, again, just the original academic study, he actually showed eight out of eight patients post uh, CAR T infusion over one year actually obtained drug-free remission. And he just presented some data at ULAR last week where he's showing some of these patients are three years post uh, this initial infusion. So really compelling validation for use of CAR T. Um, and there's still a very high unmet need in autoimmune diseases where a lot of the standard of care products have limited efficacy, significant scalability limitations. And I'll just reiterate again, when you start going into these indications that you need tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of doses, autologous cannot scale to that level. You need allogeneic, but you can scale hundreds, thousands of doses from each healthy donor. So that really provides the economics behind that. And also there's a big opportunity for lymphopletion free approaches. So again, right now, all CAR-T approaches require lymphodepletion. Um, however, that comes with a lot of logistical to uh, complexities, toxicities, costs. And so really in the autoimmune space moving forward, there's a big opportunity that if someone can come in with an allogeneic lymphodepletion free approach, that would be highly differentiating. And so ultimately we're coming here with a potential best-in-class asset, proven safety and allo uh, allogenic T cells with that EBV T cell platform in 600 patients. And importantly, I won't go into that today, but we also had treated 130 patients already um, with the, that same platform in progressive multiple sclerosis. So again, an immunocompetent population. Now, interestingly, we actually just presented some preclinical data just a few weeks ago um, at an international conference for uh, cell and gene therapy where we showed that 3219 actually had comparable cytotoxic function as the autologous benchmark. But very uh, importantly here is that they showed a reduced inflammatory cytokine profile. And why this is so important is if you think about the side effect profile of CAR-Ts that often resides in kind of out of control cytokine release that can lead to IPANs and CRS. So if you show a profile that has comparable uh, efficacy, but a superior, you know, reduced inflammatory cytokine release to achieve that, that could potentially have implications for less toxicity, um, higher tolerability, and that would be very important in an autoimmune space. So again, we have to show this in the clinic, but for a preclinical perspective, it's very exciting. Now, shifting gears a little bit just toward the end here is for 3431. So this is another one of our CAR-T assets. So this is a dual targeted CAR-T. So this is targeting CD19 and CD20, still built off of that same uh, Epstein-Barr virus T cell platform. Um, and this really helps reduce the probability of relapse due to CD19 antigen loss. And this is 
very common, um, certainly in the hematological uh, space where tumor you know, resistance and microenvironment causes uh, just selectional pressures, evolutionary selectional pressures, and CD19 gets lost over time. So basically, if you have something that can target both of these, such that if CD19 goes away, you still are targeting CD20, the hypothesis here is that it really helps prevent or reduce uh, the probability of relapse. And we've already seen from autogolous CD19, CD20. So again, we're allogeneic. This is an autogolous from a few other companies. In fact, one of these is a Chinese company, CBMG, with their CAR-039 asset, is that they showed over a 90% ORR um, in very high CR rate. So they certainly had incremental efficacy. And they actually had just licensed this out to J&J &J for about $240 million last year. So again, promising. It's not allogeneic. So there's uh, ample opportunity to come in. And again, coming in with that 1XX co-stimulatory domain and that memory phenotype could potentially have incremental efficacy on top of that. So we'll see. And the preclinical data is quite compelling. Um, and you can see that we've had greater anti-tumor efficacy uh, versus an autogolous benchmark, both from tumor burden and overall survival. And we're tracking towards IND submission in the second half of 25. So finally, I'd just like to call out that uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, we're expecting initial data in Q4 2024. Uh, we're expecting data for lupus nephritis in the first half of 25 and that SLE no lymphodepletion cohort in the second half of 25. Uh, we're starting uh, hopefully an IND target for second half of 25 for 3431. And tablet cell is approved in Europe and we had just filed the BLA um, in the US. And this again is being um, uh, helped along with our partners from PureFob who ultimately commercialized that. So with that, thank you so much for your attention. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Jason, for your time. Just a few questions here. One, the first one from Maeve. It's asking the final, the beginning of the year, your uh, company, uh, the share price, a bit of a, a correction. Is there any reasons why? Yeah, I think it's a combination of a few things. So we had a multiple sclerosis um, study that we went in progress with multiple sclerosis that unfortunately didn't yield um, positive results. So we actually shuttered that program and there were certainly some investors in for that. So we've had kind of a cycling out of investors as we really hone in and focus exclusively on our allogeneic uh, CAR-T portfolio moving forward. And um, we've also had some delays in the past with Tavoleclacel um, just due to being first in class. We're the first ones to pursue an allogeneic T-cell therapy. And it just took a little bit of time to, to really work with the FDA to get that um, solidified with comparability, which we have, which is why we filed. So I think it was just a little bit of shuffling there. Sure. The next question from Grace is asking, is your T-cell recognition platform unique to your company or if there's it, which other companies are using too? Yeah, so no one else has the epstein Bar virus T-cell platform itself. So we're the only ones that are that use that endogenous EBV T cell receptor um, and then put the car in with the 1XX co similar to a domain and the memory phenotype. And I would call out that no one else in our entire industry has 600 patients that have been treated with allogeneic um, T cells so far with a regulatory approval. So that intellectual property and kind of just technical know how is exclusive to Tara. I and mean, then certainly from a manufacturing perspective, going from preclinical pilot to clinical to commercial stage um, is extremely unique to ITAR and we have that technical know-how. Sure. This question from Pro Rogan, he's asking which of your pipelines has the most potential? Yeah, so I'd say probably right now in the autoimmune space, just if you're looking at pure just numbers, is, is probably um, probably the highest. Uh, just based off the of lupus nephritis SLE, you're talking tens, hundreds of thousands of patients just with lupus nephritis and SLE alone. And if you kind of demonstrate proof of principle here targeting CD19, you can, you know, we're looking at this as well as uh, potentially looking into multiple sclerosis, sclerosis, myositis. There's a whole host of different autoimmune diseases that you can target with CD19. So I think the opportunity is vast in the autoimmune space. Last question from Jonas. Uh, is it mentioned, is that he mentioned your ATA 3431 is progressing towards IND submission next year. What are the steps you need to take to achieve that uh, goal? Yeah, well, um, so, you know, preclinical data, like I said, looks great. So we're really just kind of working through, you know, the necessary files, et cetera, for regulatory purposes. Um, I would say there's a lot of lessons learned in applications from Tabo Equa as well as 3219. And certainly a lot of the data from the modules have a lot of carryover. So like I said, we're, we're progressing very nicely there. Thank you, Jason, for your time here today for an answer to all the questions from the audience. Thank you. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you.